Vincent Harding is the voice I want to hear this week. The conversation I had with him before his death at 82 in 2014 ever after changed the way I think about our democratic experiment. He was a leading figure in the civil rights movement, and he was wise about how the civil rights vision might speak to 21st century realities. Just as importantly, Vincent Harding pursued this by way of patient yet passionate cross-cultural, cross-generational relationship. The civil rights movement, he reminded us, was spiritually as well as politically vigorous. It aspired to a beloved community, not merely a tolerant, integrated society. Vincent Harding posed and lived a question that is freshly in our midst again. Is America possible? How do we work together? How do we talk together in ways that will open up our best capacities and our best gifts? My own feeling that I try to share again and again, Krista, is that when it comes to creating a multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious democratic society, we are still a developing nation. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Vincent Harding was Professor Emeritus of Religion and Social Transformation at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. I interviewed him in 2011. Back in 1955, he was working towards his master's degree in history in Chicago when the Montgomery bus boycott began. Eventually, he and a few friends, both black and white, traveled south to see how they could be of use. Along the way, they paid a life-changing visit to another young man in his late 20s, Martin Luther King Jr., Vincent Harding says that the phrase civil rights never adequately described King's vision or the human transformation that it stirred. King, for his part, was intrigued by Harding's work with the Mennonites, one of the original peace churches. And by the early 1960s, Vincent Harding and his late wife, Rosemary, had moved to Atlanta just around the corner from the Kings. They founded Mennonite House there, which helped the civil rights movement develop its philosophy and its practice of nonviolence. Were you raised Mennonite? No, no. I had the marvelous fortune, gift, blessing of being raised by a mother who shortly after I was born became a single mother and who had just great hopes for me. And one of the things that my mother wisely did was that she joined a fascinating little church in Harlem Mm. called Victory Tabernacle Seventh-day Christian Church. These were magnificent women and men, a mixture of uh, working class, professional class, all kinds of class. And they loved me, held me, recognized that I had possibilities that I didn't recognize myself at the outset. I had to leave them after a while because I'd come to different conclusions uh, than they did. But even after I left, what I found out over the years was that love trumps doctrine Mm. every time. And I'm still deeply connected to some of the folks that I grew up with in that church 60, 70 years ago. Mm. So, you know, I want to spend most of our time talking about the present day. And mm-hmm. um, and I want you to bring the fullness of your moral imagination and spiritual imagination that emerged from all your experiences, including, of course, that and the civil rights movement. For example, uh, one of the words that's getting tossed around a lot is civility and civil. And I noticed that you've said, you've stated very emphatically that, that you think to call that 
movement, that transformation that you were part of in the 1960s, to reduce it to civil rights. <laughs> it, that, that civility in that case is is not a big enough word. And um, you know, and I, I'm, what I'm hearing as I have this conversation now is a lot of people feel like civility is not a big enough word for us right now either. So, talk to me about that. Do you have any thoughts about that? Mm. Yes, I think that um, there are many things that have come to my mind, Krista, during this discussion that's going on. And interestingly enough, I hadn't quite made the connection that you are making now with my own thought, but that's wonderful. That's why we need each other. (laughs) Um, I have felt increasingly that what we are really talking about is not how we can have more civil conversation, but what we're talking about in the context of our society, for one thing, is how we can learn how to have a democratic conversation. Mm. That is what we need. We are absolutely amateurs at this matter of building a democratic nation made up of many, many peoples of many kinds, from many connections and convictions, and from many experiences. Mm. And to know how, after all the pain that we have caused each other, how to carry on democratic conversation that, in a sense, invites us to hear each other's best arguments Mm. and best contributions so that we can then figure out how do we put these things together to create a more perfect union. I, f- I found that that way you keep pointing for years, for decades, it, you know, that, that asking about how to be democratic is really taking seriously that question of living into a more perfect union. I, f- I find that helpful as a way to open that word up. Open and for me, Krista, mm-hmm. it also opens up the question of what does it mean to be truly human? Mm-hmm. Democracy is simply another way of speaking about that question. Religion is another way of speaking about that question. What is our purpose in this world? And is that purpose related to our responsibilities to each other and to the world itself? All of that seems to me to be a variety of languages getting at the same reality. Right. And so you mentioned the religious piece of it, and you very strongly make the link in your telling of this, the story of the civil rights movement, the, the healing link between religion and democratic transformation. Would you talk to me about that a little bit, about what we've forgotten about the spiritual and religious dimensions of that? Let's remember, Krista, that that community that helped to create King and that he then helped to nurture was a community deeply grounded in the life of religion and spirituality. This was their way of being. For instance, everyone near him knew that he took very seriously this traditional, beautiful terminology when he said that what he was seeking for was not simply equality or rights, but what he was seeking for was the creation of the beloved community Mm. that he saw everything that crushed against our best human development and our best communal development, like segregation, like white supremacy, when he moved to break down those laws, those practices, he was doing it not simply as an act of civil Hmm. action, 
but a deep spiritual responsibility, seeing our best possibilities, like my church community saw in me. He saw it in this nation. People like Jimmy Baldwin and others, Malcolm, for a certain time, couldn't imagine how Martin could see those possibilities. But I think he was seeing it because he was looking with an eye that was deeply filled by love and compassion. And that eye opens us up to see many things that might otherwise be missed. I woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom I woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom I woke up this morning I'm Krista Tippett and this is On Being. Today, summoning the wisdom for now of the late civil rights elder Vincent Harding. In the decades after the 1960s, Vincent Harding wrote a seminal book, Hope and History, Why We Must Share the Story of the Movement. And he began to bring young people together with elders of the movement. He founded the Veterans of Hope Project at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver to institutionalize this work in creative ways. Most riveting and instructive for the young, as Vincent Harding told it, are stories of how civil rights leaders have worked on society while at the same time constantly working on themselves. Stayed on freedom I'm walking and talking with my mind Stay Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. This idea of storytelling and the importance yes. of stories in um, the importance of stories just for human beings in general, but in a moment like this in particular comes up so much and yet yes. I feel like we don't I don't know if this if we don't have the forms for it in this mm. culture or mm. if it's happening under the surface and not being pointed at I mean you are doing this my own sense to uh, Krista is that there is something deeply built into us that needs story itself that story is a source of nurture that we cannot become really true human beings Mm. for ourselves and for each others without story. And to find ways in which to tell it, to share it, to create it, to encourage younger people to create their own stories. For instance, In the work that we do with the Veterans of Hope, we also encourage the younger people to find the elders, to find the veterans, not the celebrities, not the TV stars, but those folks who nobody else knows have lived such magnificent lives. Find them and then sit with them and learn how to ask the right questions so that the opening uh, can take place. I think that this country cannot become its best self until we find ways more effectively of institutionalizing that process Mm. of sharing the stories of the elders. You know, when you say that we as human beings have a built-in need for stories, um, what your work shows is that we human beings also know what to do with stories, right? So that, as you say, the young people you work with know to take those stories as tools and pieces of empowerment in this day, this year. For their own best work because now uh, it's a powerful time in this country for young people and others to be asking the question and what are we for mm. 
Do we exist for some reason other than competing with China or finding uh, the best uh, possible technological advances? Are there some things that are even deeper that we are meant for, meant to be, meant to do, uh, meant to achieve? Jimmy Baldwin used to like to talk about us achieving ourselves, finding Mm. who we are, what we're for, and making that possible uh, for each other. And so we've... You're right about this. You know, the story, just as you were speaking, what I was thinking about, Krista, was when the mother with the baby at her bosom starts telling stories. It is clearly not just to pass on information. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. And what I find is that even in some of the strangest situations, most often where I go, where I speak, where I share, I start out by asking people to tell a little of their stories. And it is amazing what people discover of themselves, right. of their connections, of their community, and it, it's, it's wonderful. You know, boy, I've learned that too. To ask someone even to tell a little of their story is to give them a gift because yes. we don't get asked that question and we do learn as much as we tell. You know, you wrote a very important book, Hope and History, 1990, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think that was, was about or, the time. You must mm-hmm. have been writing it in the 80s. There's a story you tell that, again, I felt offered up a really practical image for now. Um, It was about a conversation, an encounter you were having in a hard neighborhood in Boston and Mm -hmm. a young man named Daryl. Yes. Would you tell that story about signposts, his image of signposts? Hmm. What I remember from that story was that a dear young friend of mine, uh, Eugene Rivers, young at that time, I guess Gene Gene is a good deal old. Still busy in Boston. You're still busy in Boston. (laughs) Yeah. That, that, by the way, is one of the characteristics of many of the elders uh, that we have interviewed in the Veterans Project, that people are persistent, that they go on and on and on, something that is not appreciated in this uh, soundbite society. If you don't get it told, done, uh, accomplished in 10 minutes or 10 days or even 10 years, then you surely give up and turn away. But people like Jean uh, and others, Grace Boggs is one of the great women who came out of a Chinese ancestry, first generation in this country, married eventually uh, a black man from Alabama who was a union organizer in Detroit. And the two of them, Grace and Jimmy Boggs, became a tremendous team until uh, Jimmy died some years ago. Grace is now 95. And in Detroit, she is one of the primary encouragers of the young people there not to be swept away by all of the talk about the end of Detroit, about the the failures of Detroit. But she is working with young people to help them to become those who build again, create again. Well, all of that takes us away from the story, (laughs) but also illustrates the story. It does, yeah. I met this young man uh, in Eugene's apartment, and this young man uh, came up just to sit next to me because he wanted to talk in a more personal way. It turned out that he was one of the leaders uh, of uh, the drug-running folks uh, at the time. But what he said to me was that 
he really felt that one of the reasons why he had gone in the way that he had gone, not trying in any way to excuse himself, was the fact that he, like many other young people, were operating in a situation where they felt it was just very, very dark all around them. And what they needed were, as he put it, some some signposts, right. some lights right. that would, in other people's lives, okay, so help them. Live human signposts, you see. Yes, uh-huh. yes, that would help them to see the possibilities for themselves. And I've always felt that one of the things that we do badly in our educational process are especially working uh, with so-called marginalized young people is that we educate them to figure out how quickly they can get out of the darkness and get into some much more pleasant uh, situation when what is needed again and again are more and more people like Gene who will stand in that darkness, who will not run away from those deeply hurt communities and will open up uh, possibilities that other people can't see in any other way except seeing it through human beings who care about them. And if we teach young people to run away from the darkness rather than to open up the light in the darkness, to be the candles, the signposts, then we are doing great harm to them and the communities uh, that they have come out of. I think this word signpost and this image of signpost is really important. I think it's an important piece of practical vocabulary. Um, you said a minute ago about elders, that what you also tell young people is that they have to find the elders, right? I, yes, I've thought a yes. lot over the years about the the teaching in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament that I think has resonance across the traditions of developing eyes to see and ears to hear. I think of that as almost a, a, a spiritual discipline that the 21st century makes more necessary. That whole idea of discipline is one that clearly we have cast aside except when we're talking about technological development or military development. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems to me that we need, again, to recognize that to develop the best humanity, the best spirit, the best community, there needs to be discipline, practices of exploring. How do you do that? All right. How do we work together? How, to go back to our conversation, how do we talk together in ways that will open up our best capacities and our best gifts? My own feeling that I try to share again and again, Krista, is that when it comes to creating a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, democratic society, we are still a developing nation. (laughs) We've only been really thinking about this for about half a century. But my own deep, deep conviction is that the knowledge, like all knowledge, is available to us if we seek it. The older I get, the more I am convinced that that magnificent madman, Jesus, was really talking about something very truthful and powerful when he said, you know, if you allow yourself to really hunger and thirst after the right way, then if you will not back off from that hunger and that thirst, if you will just keep after it, then you will find the way. You will be filled. The way will find you. 
And I think that that determination to find a truly democratic society and to create the truly beloved community, uh, those are things that can be available to us if we're willing to work with each other and work with the universe uh, on developing them. They don't come free and easy. They are tough, tough tasks uh, for us to take on. This is the voice of Mavis Staples, one of the people who, as Vincent Harding described it, sang the way to freedom in the 1960s. As we'll hear in just a minute, in creative and profound ways, this also included songs like This Little Light of Mine and Kumbaya. You can listen again and share this conversation with Vincent Harding through our website, onbeing.org. There you can also download this show or my entire unedited conversation with Vincent Harding. It includes much more of his wonderful personal story, how his enjoyment of basic combat training led him to the Mennonites, and how he first met Martin Luther King Jr. joking in bed in his pajamas while recovering from a gunshot wound. Also, more about lesser-known veterans of civil rights, veterans of hope, as Vincent Harding called them. a tree planted by the water water we shall not be I'm Krista Tippett on being continues in a moment we shall not we shall not be moved oh, like a tree Planted by the water, yeah, we shall not be moved. Yeah. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, in an unsettled political moment, at the end of a divisive electoral campaign, we're invoking the wisdom of the late civil rights elder Vincent Harding. He was a leading figure in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. He was also a close friend and occasional speechwriter to Martin Luther King Jr. Vincent Harding posed and lived a question that is freshly in our midst again. Is America possible? That question, uh, how do we do it? is absolutely the question that I think is rising to the surface past our calls for civil discourse, moral imagination. But, you know, some of the tools you offer up, some of the answers to that question, are also quite wonderful. I mean, the discipline is mixed with the arts and creativity, yes, right? I yes. mean, you talk about your memory of those years of the 60s, that hard fight that also contained so much violence and darkness. You say you have a memory of people singing their freedom. Yes. Tremendous creativity. That's, I um, go back to some of the old black preacher, speaker uh, practices by putting uh, letters and words together. When I think about Martin, I think about Martin with the three C's. <laughs> courage, compassion, and creativity. Mm -hmm. And I think that the stoking of our creative capacities is one of the jobs that uh, is still uh, necessary for us. I'm always talking to my young hip-hop uh, young people 
about the fact that we need some new songs uh, from the hip-hop generation that will speak about the beloved community in whatever terminology they choose now. But we need some music that people can join together in to express their great need and desire for a better world. Do they engage you in that conversation? Oh, yes, they do. We have a a fantastic time as we try to figure out, and now what are the new songs yeah. and what are the new words? So I mean, For instance, let yeah. me just mention yeah, one word that we've been working with lately. I've been on a campaign encouraging people as we think about the beloved community to stop using this word minority, mm. that there is something negative about that terminology because it always uh, suggests that somebody else is the majority. And the fact is that we are all now creating a new majority. We are all part of this beloved community. In community, the concept of minority simply doesn't work. You don't have Mm. a minority in a family. Right. And so we have got to get new words, new songs, new possibilities for ourselves. And again, that that phrase, beloved community, was this phrase from the gospel, which Martin Luther King used so evocatively to describe that community of the civil rights movement. But what you wrote about how this little light of mine was sung at Selma, Mm-hmm. That rather than saying, Governor Wallace, yes, give us yes. our freedom, it was about singing this little light of mine, yes. I'm going to let it shine. Well, that was that was so much part of the way in which the songs try to encourage us not simply to be reactors so that Instead of saying, you know, you honky governor, we're going to, you know, you know good, um, and we're going to do this or that to you, the, the basic, deepest word was, whatever you do, we're going to let our light shine. God gave it to us. We're going to let it shine, was the way that the words went. And that determination to make our own action and our own commitment the focal point rather than a reaction to the moves of others was, I think, one of the most beautiful things Mm. about, about the scene. This is the voice of Betty Mae Fikes, a teenager at the time and one of the Freedom Singers, the music arm of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The year this was recorded, 1963, she spent three weeks in jail for singing during the civil rights struggles in Selma. Let me mention another of those songs that recently came up in a New York Times uh, article, I don't know if you saw this, someone was writing about this terminology that we've taken about a kumbaya moment, Mm -hmm. where we have made fun, in a way, of this whole experience that came out of the black church of the singing of that song. Hmm. And whenever somebody jokes about Kumbaya, uh, my mind goes back to the Mississippi summer experience where the movement folks in Mississippi were inviting co-workers to come from all over the country, especially student types, to come and help in the process 
of voter registration and freedom school teaching and taking great risks on behalf of the transformation of that state and of this nation. And there were two weeks of orientation. The first week was the week in which uh, Schwerner and Goodman and their beloved brother, uh, Jimmy, were there. And it was during the time that they had left the campus that they were first arrested, then released, and then murdered. And the word came back to us uh, at the orientation that the three of them had not been heard from. Mm. And Bob Moses, uh, the magnificent uh, leader of so much of the work in Mississippi, got up and told these hundreds of predominantly white young people that if any of them felt that at this point they needed to return home or to their schools, we would not think less of them at all, Hmm. but would be grateful to them for how far they had come. But he said, let's take a couple of hours just for people to spend time talking on the phone with parents or whoever uh, to try to make this decision and make it now. And what I found as I moved around among the small groups that began to gather together to help each other was that in group after group, people were singing, Kumbaya, come by here, my Lord. Somebody's missing, Lord. Mm. Come by here. We all need you, Lord. Come by here. And I could never laugh at kumbaya moments after that because I saw then that almost no one went home from there. They were going to continue on the path that they had committed themselves to. And a great part of the reason why they were able to do that was because of the strength and the power and the commitment that had been gained through that experience of just singing together, mm. Kumbaya. Kumbaya. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, summoning the wisdom for now of the late civil rights elder Vincent Harding. He was a pivotal figure in that movement of the 1960s, and he worked to bring its lessons usefully and creatively to young people and the rest of us in the present day. listening to the BBC in the recent weeks and they were, you know, they're watching us from afar. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they were interviewing uh, a journalist about this moment in American history which seems yes. very tumultuous and mm-hmm. the question was is it really more violent and more despairing than it's been before or does this happen repeatedly and the comparison was made with the 1960s and they said, look, There was a lot of social turmoil then. There were assassinations, right? I mean, many assassinations. But um, this journalist said, and I just want to know what you think. He said that he thought the difference between the 1960s and now uh, was that even though there was incredible tumult and violence, it was at the very same time a period of intense hope. And um, people could see that they were moving towards goals, and that that's missing now. What do you think about that analysis? 
Mm. Krista, I think that that is such a complicated kind of issue that I can only pick at it and tease it out and Mm -hmm. play with it in the best sense of play. (laughs) I think that what I see now is the fact that all over this country, wherever I go, and of course where I go tends to be sort of self-selective, because I am most often going into situations where people are operating out of a sense of hope and possibility, Mm. where in their local situations, whether it be Detroit or Atlanta or campus someplace or church community in Philadelphia, that there are women and men and young people who are operating out of hope. My sense is that in the 60s, there was probably a larger kind of canopy uh, of hope Mm. uh, that we could see and we could identify and that people could name and focus on. Now we are in particular spots, locations, sometimes seemingly isolated. But I feel that there are points, focal situations where that is still available and where people are operating from that. So I think that it is not simply the matter of hope or no hope. I have a feeling that one of the deeper transformations that's going on now is that for the white community of America, there is this uncertainty growing about its own role, its own control, its own capacity to name the realities that it has moved into a realm of uncertainty that it did not allow itself to face before. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the place that we are in, and that's even more the reason why we've got to figure out what was King talking about when he was seeing the possibility of a beloved community Mm. and recognize that maybe for some of us that cannot come until some of us realize that we must give up what we thought was only ours in the building of a beloved nation. Can there be a beloved nation? Why don't we try and see? My country tis of thee Sweet land of liberty Of thee We bow to sing There's a question that you pose in your writing that you've posed in recent years, is America possible? Mm. Which kind of echoes back to your assertion that we need more than civil discourse now. We need to more fully realize what it means to be a democracy. And I just wonder, when you answer that question, is America possible, what, what people come to mind, what answers come to mind in the form of the hope that you see embodied? One of the great benefits of living almost to my 80th birthday is the great privilege of being able to meet and be with all kinds of marvelous people. 
I spend a lot of my time in places like Philadelphia, where on the northwest side, I've been deeply involved with a church community there, a Methodist church led by a magnificent uh, woman pastor who has embraced the young people of the community in ways that churches often do not. Young people who are considered marginalized Mm -hmm. have become the heart of her work, and they have seen their own possibilities. I remember when a group of them came out to visit us at our project uh, in Denver. Uh, They were true Philadelphians. They were dressed from the Philadelphia streets. They (laughs) moved like Philadelphians, and they ran into some very interesting encounters (laughs) in in Denver. Uh. But at one point, two of them, one young man, one young woman, took me aside and said, could we talk to you for just a minute? And they had started to call me Uncle Vincent. And they said to me, Uncle Vincent, why do you love us so? And what I saw was that they had this great capacity to know that they were being loved, to feel it in their being, and through later conversation that we had, to recognize that that meant they had power and responsibility to do something for their community that had not been done for them. Hmm. I see young people like that all over this country And I know that they exist. I know some of the adults who work with them in places like Greensboro, North Carolina, in Detroit, Michigan, on the reservations in New Mexico, out in the L.A. area. We've got working connections uh, with young people and their adult nurturers in all of those kinds of situations. And because I see that, feel that, receive their returning love, I know they are capable of building the beloved community. And so it is that kind of constant engagement with people who have been considered hopeless, useless, purposeless, just like I saw them in the Deep South, people who were considered backward, unable to do anything, became the creators of a new possibility for the whole nation. Hmm. And when I think about... Tiananmen Square Mm -hmm. and Prague, I realized that those folks in Mississippi and Alabama who were considered useless were able to speak to the world. Mm. I see that again and again and again right in this country, see it with young people, see it with those who are loving them into new possibilities. And so that's why, for me, the only answer that I can give to the question that I raise is yes, as we make it possible. Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Vincent Harding was chairperson of the Veterans of Hope Project at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver. He was also professor of religion and transformation there. He published wonderful writings, including his book, Hope and History, Why We Must Share the Story of the Movement, and an essay, Is America Possible? You can find that essay at onbeing.org. 
At veteransofhope.org, you can delve into a vast repository of Vincent Harding's interviews over several years of his fellow elders, the leading women and men of the civil rights movement. This is the email we received from the Veterans of Hope Project in 2014 about his death. At 5.11 p.m. on Monday, May 19th, with the spirit of many ancestors surrounding him, the great soul, Dr. Vincent Harding, left this world. On Being is Trent Gillis, Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Mariah Helgeson, Maya Tarrell, Marie Sambalay, Bethany Mann, Selena Carlson, Brendan Sturmer, and Ross Feehan. On Being was created at American Public Media. Our funding partners are the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide at FordFoundation.org. The Fetzer Institute, helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, working to create a future where universal spiritual values form the foundation of how we care for our common home. The Henry Luce Foundation, in support of public theology reimagined. And the Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. On Being is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is a Krista Tippett public production. Ah.